Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Sunday, um, January 20, 2019, and this will be the Sunday uh, message. <coughs> I usually uh, try to go and attend one of the local churches and then share, <coughs> but I've been kind of sick, and I was getting ready to go out because I do like to uh, teach either at my daughter's or by the water. <laughs> but I was <coughs> did some work, <coughs> and I'm, I don't have a lot of energy at all. And I thought, let me just make the video. It's about uh, ten thirty Sunday morning. What I want to do, I'm, and then I might do a little bit more history, and uh, being it's just us talking. Uh, the verse is for today's Sunday Mass, or what I want to cover and teach on. And a little bit on, uh, sort of interesting, the other night <laughs> after I did a video with some of my homeless friends, and it was off the cuff, but kind of there were like confirmation from three friends, me and the two other brothers I was with, and it was very interesting because I, I was reading Hebrews the last few days earlier, and I tried to think what theme... If I'm going to talk with some of my homeless friends off the cuff, what would be the theme that I would maybe speak on? And I didn't really do it. I just quoted something. But I was reading Hebrews. And uh, God, who at sundry times and in diverse ways spoke in time passion to our fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Hebrews 1. And so the theme, if I were going to teach that day, it would have been diversity. It would have been the various ways that God communicates to and through his people. And actually, that kind of occurred that day with my homeless friends, because the word was confirmed through some of the different things. And so that was the theme on my mind. And then uh, Friday evening, I began looking at the verses for today's Sunday Mass. And we. Be at, I'll start with... <coughs> <coughs> the, f the first one that I wrote down for the reading would be Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 5. And the prophet is simply saying, uh, God's people are going to be this royal, this crown in the hand of God, this jewel in the hand of God. And God's going to be glorified through his people. Now, for my Catholic friends, the theme really will be about the glory of God in these passages, okay? And so sometimes uh, the priest is, maybe doesn't have the time to really focus on what is the theme for all the passages. And so that's what I try to connect with. So all the readings today, really that would be the theme, how the glory of God is going to be manifested. And in the Isaiah passage 62, 1 through 5, we see that God's people, and there's this gathering of the church, both Jew and Gentile, and God's going to manifest his glory through his people. Um, there's a verse in that short passage, one that I quote, and I forget offhand what it is, so maybe I won't quote it, <coughs> but um, there is one that, I, uh, there's many I quote from Isaiah, all right? So that's the theme from the Isaiah reading. We, God's people, are going to be a royal uh, diadem in the hand of God. Uh, there are passages in James that say, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised those that love him. Now in the Isaiah 62 it also says God's going to give us a new name, and write on us a new name. Okay, now John the Apostle, we'll get to the miracle of in John chapter 2 in a minute, uh, who wrote the book of Revelation and the gospel in the first, and first, second, and third John. <laughs> John says he saw the bride coming down out of heaven. The new Jerusalem, okay, the new name. The Apostle Paul will also speak about that in his writings in the New Testament. The new city of God. And there's this new name, okay, that no man knows but he who gave it. 
And sometimes we say, what is that secret name that we're all going to have? You see, Paul will write in the letter to the Corinthians that the only way that a person could know the name of Jesus and enter into that covenant is by the Spirit of God. I has not seen, neither has ear heard, but the things that God has prepared for those who love him and that for those who wait for him. But by his Spirit, he has revealed these things to us. Christ. And so the new name, if you will, that no man knows, you see, in the natural mind, natural knowledge and understanding, no man can know that. It's the new birth and coming into this city of God is a new name that you only get when God reveals himself to us through Christ, all right? And so that's the new name that God writes on the eye, John, so the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we are going to give glory to God. We're going to bring forth glory to God. Now, the, let's see, I'll get to 1 Corinthians 12, but it starts in verse 4. So that evening, as I was meditating on the diversity of the gifts, and me and those two other brothers, three of us, uh, so that was the theme that I kind of was thinking about. And 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, it actually starts at the passage about spiritual gifts and diversity. And uh, for, in those first couple of verses, verse 4 and 5, maybe 6, it talks about diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Different operations, but the same Lord. Different manifestations. And I thought that was interesting because... There were, there were, in that passage, the apostle is saying, there's this variety. You see, God in the past, at sundry times, and in diverse manners, spoke to the prophets, as in the last day spoken unto us through his Son. And the Spirit of God in the church, there are different operations, there are different manifestations, there are different gifts. And then the rest of that reading would be <laughs> talking about the spiritual gifts. Um, to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, working in miracles. But all these are working together, the one and the self same Spirit. And when God is functioning through His church, through His people, the glory of God manifests itself. Because it's not men. You see, when God confirms His word through a homeless person, your sons are for signs and wonders, or through vessels that you realize, okay, that wasn't them, or that wasn't the knowledge of a man, like God speaks throughout your walk in, in the church, in the kingdom of God, those of you who are believers, you know there have been experiences where maybe out of the mouths of babes, maybe somebody said something, but they didn't realize that that word they spoke was significant, but you knew. And I've had that experience with different friends over many years. And normally when I see that happen, then I realize you don't glorify that vessel per se. You recognize, okay, this is somebody maybe that's in my life for a period of time, a season that you interact with, and you realize and normally, if something like that happens with different people in the kingdom of God, normally it's consistent. Like they'll bring something up, they'll speak a word, they have no idea the significance of that word. It might be something you read in the scripture the night before. And once one that diversity and that operation and that manifestation, you or me, you realize, oh, that's significant. And you might even realize that person's not really the most spiritual or knowledge, but that's the gift. And so that's how God receives that glory through those diverse operations, okay? And as I reviewed that passage the same evening, getting ready, you know, to talk about them, the thing that came to my mind at that stage of reviewing the verses was the significance of diversity. And then the three. The verse even came to my mind, threefold cord is not easily broken. 
And then I, as I turn to the next passage, which we'll get to now, I thought, okay, there's something with diversity. There's something with three. <laughs> Just coming to my mind as I'm studying, a threefold chord shall not uh, be easily broken. Wisdom builds the house. Understanding establishes it. And through knowledge, its chambers are filled with all pleasant and precious riches. So we have a significance. So, John chapter 2, we're going to get to the miracle of water into wine. And as I went to that passage to review it, it says, And on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And this is where I figured if I speak like this on just us, if you will, I'll do a little history here. Um, this miracle, when I taught the Gospel of John, um, we talked about the uniqueness of John's Gospel. We have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we refer, we refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic Gospels because they pretty much follow the same type of theme throughout. And that's led some scholars to say Mark was the main one that maybe the other Matthew and Luke kind of uh, used as well. But either way, John is, John's is not called synoptic because it's very different. And in this particular chapter, John is the only writer who records this miracle. Now you would think, as we talk about this miracle of water and the wine, you would think, why would the other writers not include it? And the skeptics, you know, that they come up with different reasons. There were a few reasons, possibly, why the others didn't record it. What we read in this chapter is they're invited to a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the people run out of wine at the party. And so, like the servants of this wedding, <laughs> come and say, you know, they don't have wine, and Jesus' mom, Mary, brings that kind of request to him. And he gives the response that some say is, you know, sort of rude. But woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And she says to those servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Then there were six stone pots that were used to have uh, carry water for the washing and Jewish ceremonial stuff. And so then he tells these servants, fill them, fill the six pots. And then... They fill them with water, then they draw out, they get the liquid out of the pots, and sure enough, it's wine. And then the ruler, or the man in charge of that wedding, when he realizes, man, this is really good wine, and the servants, it says, they knew what happened. But the ruler, or the man in charge of that wedding didn't know, but he makes the statement, he says, Hey, this is cool because most people put out the good wine first. But you have saved the best for last. Now, remember, now the last verse will be, In this beginning of miracles, Jesus did at Canaan Galilee and began to show forth and manifest his glory. Okay, so I want you to catch that part. That's the theme. Now he's manifesting through the miracles and the working. Okay, why a few reasons... Why do you think maybe the other writers didn't pick up on that? But John did in his gospel. John, well, let me start with this first. It's possible that that miracle, which is very significant to those who were at the feast that day, but it's possible that John's the only one that picked up on it. It wasn't the raising of the dead that Matthew or one of the others would kind of say, oh, look, it was kind of manifesting his glory, but it's in a way that a lot of people didn't realize what happened, because that's what's in the text. And those that were the servants that day, that he said, just pour that, fill those pots up with water, and then when they took it out, behold wine, it's possible that there was a lot going on at that wedding. And Jesus didn't stop and say, blow the trumpet. Look, I did, look at the miracle. 
Now it does say that it does say that he began. This is the beginning of miracles that Jesus did, manifesting forth his glory. But it wasn't the type of miracle of the raising of the dead or the opening the eyes of a blind person that would really garner a lot of immediate attention. So it's possible that John, the writer of John's Gospel, the younger disciple, it's possible that he was a little more privy to what happened that day, meaning the others might not have known. And we read that later in John's Gospel as well, which I told about recently at the betrayal. Jesus sits with the men. One of you at the table is going to betray me. Peter says, ask him who it is. And Jesus is, John is kind of leaning on the bosom of Jesus. And Jesus says, it's whoever, after I dip the sop, the bread, I give it to. That's the one. But it says no one else at the table knew except for John. So we see a little evidence there in the gospel itself that John kind of was privy to some of the stuff that the others didn't know. That, okay, that could be one reason why we only read that in John's Gospel, and then I'll give you the other one, and then the significance of what this miracle means. Okay, John, in his writings, it's a unique Gospel, we said, and if John's Gospel was written later on, and not as early <laughs> as the other Gospels, John himself, in the New Testament letters of first particularly 1 John, but in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you'll notice that John's theme is combating an early heresy that arose in the church. With, it rose in the 1st century, really kind of we more prominent in the 2nd century, but it's called docetism or Gnosticism, Gnostics. And these were sort of an early group, uh, the, the famous bishop, of North Africa, Hippo, North Africa, St. Augustine, a few centuries later. He was also influenced by a group called the Manichaeans. And th this was like before he became the bishop, before St. Augustine became a great, if you will, church father in church history. So you had early Christian thinkers and philosophers in a mix of this that kind of mixed in Christianity with philosophy and with some of these different belief systems. Now, John himself is one of the prominent writers in the New Testament, the same writer of the Gospel of John, who begins to combat that heresy. Now, part of that heresy, docetism or Gnosticism, they get the name uh, because of, they believe that they taught that Jesus really did not die physically on the cross, but it was a phantom. It was sort of like an angel or a spirit type of a situation. That's the heresy they taught. And they also had a belief, mixed in with the Greek philosopher's belief, that matter was inherently evil. That the creation, they had a sort of belief that the Old Testament God was different than the God of Jesus. And that the Old Testament God was also the one who created the world and everything and all the matter and all of that was evil. Now, that's not the Christian worldview or the Christian teaching, but this was mixed in with their beliefs. Now, the Christians understood that the heavens declared the glory of God and the firmament showed this handiwork and that creation itself is not evil. It's not bad. It's not like what the Greek philosophers said, matter is evil. No, it's not. Okay, The sinful flesh, the carnal mind, the carnal desires, we have those scriptures about. But it's not talking about the creation. We read scriptures that said Satan is the god of this world. It's talking about the system of unbelievers and sin and everything else, not the earth itself. So, we do know that John combats that whoever in the, his letters, those who deny that Jesus Christ is really come in the flesh. This is the one who has come and became God incarnate. Okay, so combating the concept that the earth and matter itself is evil. Now, the other reason John might have included this one 
even if the other disciples were aware of it or the other writers of the gospel, was maybe they didn't see a miracle of this nature, meaning water into wine, as real significant, though it is. Now, if John wrote later, and we know he combated this belief that elements are, are naturally, inherently evil, which was a belief that was not true, then this miracle would make some sense because it's dealing just with the elements, you see. It's not the opening of the eyes of a blind man, raising of the dead, which are the primary miracles that are focused on in the Gospels. But this is one where John is proclaiming also to the Gnostics that those of us, Jesus took that natural water and did a sanctified thing with it, you see, turned it into wine. All right, so that could be the other reason I'm just giving you that. But what's the significance? And the ruler of the feast, when Jesus did this miracle, said, you saved the best wine for last. And Jesus himself, we read in the Gospels, talks about the new covenant, the new testament, is the new wine. And so that would fit the whole theme of our New Testament. That the old covenant came first. And the writer of Hebrews again will say, but we have a better covenant. So the New Testament in the blood of Jesus Christ, which he tells his men at the Last Supper, the last meal, this is the blood New Testament, shed for many for the mission of sins. That's a better covenant. And that's really the theological teaching from that. The better wine, the better covenant, right? That's a whole theme in the New Testament. Read that in Hebrews. God take it away the first covenant that he might establish the second. I taught that recently. And so that's the significance of that. And Jesus himself in another teaching will say, no people take new wine and put it into old bottles or old wineskins or else the bottles or the wineskins break. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and they will both be preserved. Again, he was talking about the new covenant in that teaching. So that's significant in the water into wine, all right? We're in a better covenant. We're in a new covenant. Uh, the next, what is the next verse? Let's see. There was one verse... Uh, that's not in the actual reading, but it's like one of the Alleluia praise verses. But it happened to be Second Thessalonians 2.14. God's called us to the gospel, and he's called us to the glory of Jesus. Now, let me hit on this a little bit. In John 17, the great intercessory prayer of Jesus, he says, Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Okay. Then he says, speaking about us, the disciples, that we would be one, that we would show forth the witness of God through unity. And then it says, the glory, Jesus is the glory which you gave to me, I have given them, that they may be one. Now, I do understand that seems... Strange, but like I said, that's the theme. The one in Thessalonians, I just quoted, whatever that was, partakers of his glory. So God's church, in the theme of what we're talking about, when the Spirit of God is functioning through God's people, God is being glorified. And he shared that in the history of the development of Christianity, a little bit that I'm talking about today as well in this teaching, there were divisions many divisions. The famous, the, one of the first famous ones, the date happens to be 1054 AD. It's got a lot to do with, and we call that the Great Schism. Now the Protestant Reformation took place in the 16th century, meaning the 1500s, but that's not called the Great Schism, but well, not, you could say that was the really bigger division within Christianity, historically. But the one in 1054 AD, it was really something that was coming for a while and had to do with the first millennia of, millennium of Christianity, first thousand years, 
over a period of time, you had the Western Church, Latin Church, Rome, and had differences with what we say the Eastern Orthodox, Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, okay? And these were divisions between Greek Orthodoxy and the Roman Catholic Church. And ultimately, it was over somewhat, not a real significant thing, but it was coming in time. And ultimately, they divided. But there's a uniqueness in the Eastern Church. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, though very much like the Roman Catholic Church, but they focus more on a... It's a verse in the New Testament, Peter says, that we are partakers of the divine nature. We are partakers of the divine nature. And it's certainly a, a scriptural view that we partake of the divine nature. And that's just more of an emphasis that the Eastern Church just put forth. And in the theme today, we are partakers of the glory of God. And those verses, <coughs> Jesus is saying, I've given to them the glory, the spirit of God, the unity of God. It's in the church. It's in the people of God. And it's through this uh, union we have that God is glorified. You see, God and then when God is functioning in us, when Jesus did that miracle in Cana Galilee, it says, this beginning of miracles did Jesus and manifested forth his glory. And so now when he works in us, greater works than these will you do, Jesus said, because I go to my Father. And so in the ascension of Jesus, as well as going to the cross, he enabled the Comforter or the Spirit to come to the church. And when the Holy Spirit is functioning, in the church, the body of Christ, the people of God, all of the church, even though we have so many divisions, yet when we see, we don't overlook all the doctrinal differences we have. There are some serious doctrinal differences. But also at the same time, God uses people that don't have everything correct. Sometimes they don't understand everything. If I did a whole little review of history, there were times where, you know, it was easy in these church councils and all to try to come to understandings of certain things. And then we say, well, this person believes a certain thing, this church leader, and these were some of the debates that went on. But I have found that we were maybe a little too quick to, like, condemn. We, there's different names for all these different heresies that arose, the Pollyannarianism and Arianism and a lot of things and a lot of history. I said, okay, and I agree with the ecumenical councils, okay, the first seven, maybe we'll say we have, and those are the ones that most Christians agree on, and then there's others later on. But I think people were too quick to say, it's hard to define the things, you know, we're like kids and God speaks to us. And, and we want doctrine. We want to be strong on doctrine. But we also recognize that, you know, uh, except we receive the kingdom like a little child, we can in no wise enter there. All right? Now, the one, let's see, I think I hit most of them. The one psalm, it was Psalms 96. But the one verse that fits with the thing that stuck with me, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And I know that could sound strange. There's some Christian songs based on that song. Give, how do we give unto the Lord glory and strength? And we just saw in the readings today, Jesus manifest, he said that they would be one as we are one, that the world would believe that you have sent me, of Jesus and John 17, and I had given them the glory. You see, when we overcome these divisions, when we humble ourselves, God begins speaking and manifesting and working through his people. And humility, humility is uh, also recognizing that out of the mouths of babes, or out of people or groups or 
things that oftentimes we have mindsets. Certainly God can't be in that group or in that person or in that. And we develop these and Paul says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I have not charity. It doesn't, it profits me nothing. And all the gifts Paul will talk about, that's the next chapter after the one we spoke on. 1 Corinthians 12 is the spiritual gifts, but 1 Corinthians 13 is famous love chapter. And Paul will say, desire spiritual gifts. I mean, the working of miracles and all these things. In the next chapter he says, but if I have all of that, if I give my body to be burned, charity suffers long in his kind. It doesn't envy, it's not proud, it's not boastful. And you say, but isn't all the supernatural power and the gifts and all these things, which are wonderful things, isn't that how we're going to prove to the world and testify of Jesus? Actually, without love, it profits nothing. Without love, it profits nothing. In that one example we talked about today in the water and the wine, it is very possible that the other disciples weren't even aware of it, like I explained earlier. But John, he knew about it. He was, like I said, privy to certain things that maybe the others didn't see. And Jesus was not the type to tell John, make sure the other guys know about this, John. In time, they'll know. In time, people will read that testimony that John kept in his heart. He said, now it's time for me to write my gospel. And the others maybe didn't even know or didn't realize how significant it was. And John says, but I'm combating a certain heresy, and so I'll put that down. So it's, it's, it's through that humility, I think, that's a key part of God being glorified through his church, okay? They will know we are Christians by our love. That's how they're going to know, you see. And Paul and Corinthians 13, though I have faith to move mountains, which is mountain-moving faith, which Jesus would say in his in the Gospels. You say unto this mountain, be thou plucked up and be cast in the sea, and it will obey you if you believe. And Paul says, and if I have that faith, but I don't have charity, I don't have love, it means nothing. So I guess we'll end with that. I did a little, how long we got there, that's, about as long as we normally go. I don't want to do too many little updates, but um, this will, this should be a new post next Sunday. And most of you will see this video today, today's date, whatever, the 20th, January 20th. <laughs> I'm going to say 1919. Oh, 2019, January 20th, 2019. And most of you that do see these videos on the date, like I make it, it's the following Sunday that throughout the week I add the notes, meaning this will be a new post today. Earlier in this day, I still posted on Sunday a regular teaching post. For those that saw that little R, though it doesn't mean it's rated R. It's a note for me to mean that's a repost. So over time... As I, some Sundays I repost a previous Sunday teaching, and then I will also just make a new one for that Sunday. And so that little, I, I put a little R next to the earlier post today, for those who've seen it, and that's just a note for me. Over time, when I go back, that means it's a repost. I do that with our studies. Now, there's a lot of New York pictures and all. Normally, I'd be up there, and Hopefully I will be up there, and not too long from now. And that's really where I prefer to be, like on doing the videos and all. But I have took a little time to develop some things. But you know, Paul would say, though absent in body, yet present in spirit, joining and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And so it's more exciting, those of you that are in ministry, pastors, leaders, I know it's exciting to be sent out, you know, to go different places. But we also, you know, at times, 
you sending that word out, okay? Value, that'll just be word, value the storehouse that God has given you over time. Okay? This is an old radio tape duplicator. I used to duplicate tapes and do radio programs. A lot of good ministers, a lot of good teachers, preachers. Maybe you have a good 20, 30 years of recorded messages. And some people don't. They used to just save them on a cassette tape. And I did the cassette tape saving, you know. And then sometimes that's it. You know, it goes by the wayside. No, no. You, those particularly that have secretary staff, a lot. Of, I don't have nothing, none of that. You should be able to. Uh, commission one person so you know what let this, let's make a storehouse of these teachings that we've been doing for whatever 10 years 20 years and just assign one person to maybe repost those I do that myself with all of our stuff in the evening but you get a lot of people over time value the storehouse okay value the storehouse it's uh, Jesus and the parables talked about uh, running out of the oil in the lamp, okay? Now, I understand the parable of the ten virgins, and that's the lamp I got. But some took their lamps, but they didn't take any oil, any preserves. The wise, they they knew how to have a preserve that would last, okay? So, for my minister friends, it's exciting to preach and teach. We often get energized from it, because that's our calling. But also recognize if God is using you on a Sunday sermon or whatever you're doing, just set a little time, say, look, we'll have a storehouse. And if we're communicating effectively, God willing, it will go forth. Okay, so let me end it with that. I pray a blessing on everybody that watches this video today and in the future. I pray, Father, that uh, you would bring unity to all the people of God and take something, some scripture, some teaching from this Sunday sermon in two, January of 2019, and may it be used all the way for many years to come. We ask it in Jesus' name.